Thank you so much for coming to our last talk in the loft for today, The Sound of Justice Sucks with Mitchell Pasmans and Nick McDonnell. I have it on good authority that we're all meant to bully Nick during this talk for not contributing enough to the talk itself. We're going to roast him um, for 45 minutes. It's going to be great. <laughs> so I just thought I'd add that as a preamble. Um, the, during this talk, we'll be kind of throwing back to the 90s a little bit as Mitchell and Nick break down the soundtrack to the hit tactical vacuum action game, Justice Sucks, and discuss how to effectively exploit 90s nostalgia for fun and profit. Um, as ever, I'll be taking questions through Slido, so send them through at any point during the talk, um, and I'll compile them for the end of the talk. Um, and just before I hand over to Mitchell and Nick, I'd just like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations to pay my respects to their elders past and present. To acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, Mitchell and Nick, let's go to the 90s. Hello. Uh, welcome to our talk um, about our Mitchell, little vacuum sorry. action game. You mean your talk, it's okay. <laughs> I'm just going to like say, this is Mitch, he's the sound designer and composer at Samurai Punk, and uh, that's all I have to say. That he's going to do the rest. This wasn't in the script, Nick. You can turn that mic off now if you want. Um, my name is Mitchell Pasmans. I am the sound designer and music guy at Samurai Punk. With me today is the wonderful Nicholas McDonnell, who is no more talking. No more talking from Nick. Um, I will get you evicted from this venue if you try to interrupt me, I swear to God. Um, I've been a Samurai Punk for about five years. I've worked on these marvelous titles. The most recent was Kill Bug, which is a game where you kill bug um, as the kill bug. It's very good. Uh, you, you don't care about this. You want to hear about the Justice Sucks game. Uh, what is Justice Sucks? No talking. Um, about four years ago, four years, three years, we worked on a small humble bundle game called Rainbow First Blood, and in that you play as a small robot vacuum cleaner protecting his house from burglars, sort of like Home Alone style. So. You'd activate appliances as traps, you'd like drop a ceiling fan on a guy or like explode an oven or whatever, and then you had to clean up all the mess before your family got home. Justice Sucks is the sequel to that, where you get sucked into a 90s TV realm and have to fight an evil CEO and, you know, hijinks, wacky hijinks happen. I'll play a bit of the trailer so you get a little bit of an idea. This sucks. So, yeah, just standard robot vacuum cleaner game. You, you know it. Uh, for the design brief, Winston gave me a very simple task. He wanted me to make it sound like the 90s. The entire decade of the 90s homogenized into one sound that was very clear and evocative. Basically, the goal was to capitalize on the nostalgia cycle, and for anyone who doesn't know, the nostalgia cycle is basically the idea that all media is made by and for 30-year-olds and will tend to appeal to stuff that they remember from their childhood. So that's the reason we got like Jurassic Park remakes and Ghostbusters remakes coming out now, and it's the reason Stranger Things lent so heavily into that 80s aesthetic. Um, what Winston wanted me to do was to do what Stranger Things did for the 80s, but for the 90s. And he wanted me to focus more on radio music instead of video game music, which is a whole nother thing, and embrace the cheesiness and the colorfulness of it. Um, before I move on, it is worth noting that because of the nostalgia cycle, uh, we are rapidly approaching another scar resurgence, which is <laughs> incredibly exciting. Um, get hyped for that. Uh, what is the 90s? Uh, it is the period of time between 1990 and 2000. There was a lot of stuff in it. Um, so there was like teen pop music, R&B, golden age hip hop, like there was a lot of underground electronic stuff happening. It was like a very diverse decade. Um, so when trying to approach a task like this, you sort of have to think about what 
is exclusively the 90s and what didn't carry over into the next decade or with what was in the 80s predominantly, um, you sort of have to think about what has aged the worst. Um, so right off the bat, we decided to avoid rock music because it is very hard to make a guitar sound distinctly 90s. And the only genre we could really think of that was exclusively 90s for rock music was grunge, and I didn't want to make a grunge soundtrack for our robot vacuum cleaner game. Um, so electronic music as well, especially in the 90s, because a lot of the hardware and software they were using was in their infancy, had a very specific tone and a very evocative tone. It was also, I'll go into it a bit later, but because it was like the surge of digital hardware for the first time people could like have beats be exactly quantized and exactly perfect. So it was like this very rigid sort of fake sort of sound. Um, I don't like 90s music a whole lot. Um, it's a controversial <laughs> thing to say at the start of my 90s talk. But um, we also found that a lot of pop music had an especially colorful and cheesy aesthetic, which matched the game a little bit better. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but I really like this random stock image I found of this dude. Anyway, uh, main influences, so we went into a bunch of teen pop and boy band stuff like your Britney Spears and your Spice Girls. Uh, main influence was Eurodance, which had a very colorful and like cheesy aesthetic. So like Venga Boys, Aqua, that sort of stuff. There was also, we lent a lot into Big Beat and a lot of other underground electronic genres. Um, Prodigy was a big influence of mine, Fatboy Slim, that sort of stuff, and also some 90s era, golden age hip hop stuff as well. Um, so this is the part where I talk about synthesizers for the next 20 minutes. Uh, the 90s was largely the era of romplers, which are digital sample based synthesizers. So for the first time, instead of trying to emulate a piano sound using like oscillators or FM synthesis or whatever, you could just record a piano and attach it to each note of a keyboard and play it back like that. Uh, that technology sort of existed in the mid 80s with like your Fairlight CMI, but it had a lot of limitations. Like the memory limitations were so much that like the biggest samples they could have were like one second long. Most of them were about a quarter of a second and they were super compressed, like really distorted. They were also, the Fairlight CMI was crazy expensive. Like I did the maths, $200,000 for that MacBook looking thing there. Um, unless you're like Peter Gabriel or whatever, you're not gonna be able to afford that. So it wasn't until the 90s where the technology caught up a little bit and it sort of became a little bit more affordable that it started to see a bit more widespread use, which led to the best-selling synthesizer of all time, the Korg M1, this beautiful piece of hardware right here. Uh, this bad boy practically defined the 90s. It was used everywhere. Um, one of the ways they got around the memory limitation was they'd take the sound, they'd cut out just the attack transient and a very small sustain loop, and they'd double that up with some subtractive synthesis as well to get something that by today's standards, it is a bad keyboard. Like, it's like a very cheesy sound. Like, we're spoiled with, you know, 64 gigabyte sample libraries for a like, violin that has eight layers for different velocities and stuff like that. But back in the day, having something that sounded vaguely like a piano was incredible. So the piano and organ sound especially were hugely popular. Like, Madonna's Vogue uses their piano preset. A bunch of Eurodance songs use it. Um, if you want to make a 90s song, this is like your secret sauce. This is the ingredient you need to use. Um, I'll play some examples now so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. Ah! And the organ bass. <laughs> ah! So a very like evocative 90s sound. Um, like instantly recognizable. I used the piano, one of the examples I used the piano was for the boss fight, I wanted to make something that was legally dissimilar to the Mortal Kombat theme. I mean, <laughs> the soundtrack is mostly legally dissimilar songs, by the way, so uh, here we go. Yeah, 
you get the idea. Um, the JV1080 was another digital sample-based synthesizer. It wasn't as quite as widely used as the M1, but it was used heaps in film and TV scores. Um, what's great about using these is they sort of act as like a time capsule into the 90s. Like all of the sounds on it were modern by the standards of like 1989 when they came out, but they're very cheesy nowadays. I used it heaps for its orchestral hit sounds, which were terrible, but terrible in a way that I really, really enjoyed. Um, here's, here's a bunch of them. That's, that's that 90s flavor you need. Uh, so the JV1080's biggest contribution to music was the pizzicato string sound, which was used in a bunch of like early techno stuff. Um, also in Venga Boys, We Like to Party. And we've all heard Venga Boys, We Like to Party, so there's no need for me to play it now. <laughs> play the whole song. I might <laughs> later. <laughs> uh, the TB303, which was the acid based synthesizer, it's a very famous sound, um, especially in the 90s in like late 90s video game music and kids cartoons for some reason. It was really big and it became sort of a shorthand for like cool and futuristic. Like if you're a 90s hacker, you'd hear like acid bass in it. This just for anyone who's not familiar, like um, yeah, that sort of sound we're talking about. It is a really cool sound. The synthesizer itself is incredibly simple. It's only one oscillator, which can either be a square or a sawtooth, and there was just a low pass on it with a mod envelope that would control how much the low pass moves up with each note. But because it was so simple, it got heaps of use in the underground electronic scene. Um, if I did this soundtrack again, I would have lent way more heavily on this because it's such an evocative sound. Um, I pretty much just used it for the nightclub combat music. Uh, you're probably familiar with the 808. I think there's one in the synth room over there. The 909 was the successor to the 808, and what the 808 was for hip hop, the 909 was for dance and house music. It's a lot more punchier and aggressive. A lot of times they'd use the kick, they'd roll off all the low mids, and they'd compress it in a way to make it even more punchy. Um, it is. It's kind of an annoying <laughs> sound as well, but it, I used it heaps. Uh, I pretty much always did like a four to the floor house beat. Um, I had to make a, well, I didn't have to make, I made a legally dissimilar Scat Man John song. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was just from one of the cinematics. I wouldn't put that in gameplay music. I wouldn't. I might. Um, so others, I'll go through some other 90s stuff I used once. I used group vocal samples a bunch, just like people out yelling yeah or whatever. Um, it's worth talking about now. The 90s approach to sampling was a little bit different than it is today. Like today, if you used a sample, you'd go through a lot of effort to make it sound cohesive with the rest of the song. Like you'd all run it through the same convolution reverb or do some like fancy compression or whatever. In the 90s, having it sound disjointed was kind of the sound that they liked. It was like having a little snippet of a song that had clearly a completely different mixing quality really grabs the ear in an interesting way. Um, this was from the cleaning up music, I think. So I'd always, almost always put it on beat four and then hard cut it on beat one as like a gated reverb sounding sort of thing. Um, orchestra hits I covered already, but here's an example in context. Um, breakbeat drums, which is more of a technique than a genre, but it's basically you take like 
a 60s era soul recording or a jazz recording and of drums, and then you chop it up. Then you chop it up in a way that is like unrealistic, and it's kind of a cool sound. I did more of a modern version of it where I dig through a bunch of drum loops and then I'd roll off the low end of them and have my kick and snare on a separate track so I could control them more in the mixing phase and then I'd sidechain compress those back to the drum loop so they'd fit in a little bit better. Here is an example. <laughs> It's a cool sound. I probably should have done a little bit more of that. Like, making this game again, it probably would have all been like acid bass and break beats. Like, if you get the chance, go back and look at the Armored Core 1 soundtrack. It's all acid bass and break beats, and it is so freaking rad. Uh, turntable scratches, very 90s sound. It's sort of kind of cheesy in modern production to have turntable scratches because nobody's actually using turntables anymore but it is like a really flavorful thing. I think we should bring it back. Here's a turntable break from, I think the winning music, I'm not sure. Um, because I'm a hack, I didn't actually use the turntable. I just dug through a bunch of samples and chopped them up. I also used the real tape emulation plugin, which had a really flavorful tape stop button where it just basically just slowed down the whole thing. Um, I found that worked a lot better than like manually pitch manipulating it. Um, the G-Funk Glide Synth, which is a, it's basically just like a sine oscillator with a really long portmanteau on it. Used heaps in the 90s in G-Funk. It's a very distinct sound. It sounds really annoying by itself. Uh, <laughs> but in context. Um, I also used a bit of the Roland D50, which is a 90s era synth, but a lot of the sounds on it, I found they had a little bit of 80s nostalgia in it. And like, because we're so familiar with the 80s sound now and how it's been like watered down in a specific way, that era tends to overpower the 90s a bunch, even though it was made in like 1989, I think. Uh, using it just felt like it was an 80s soundtrack now, which was something we wanted to avoid. Um, all right, so I had my little flavor palette of synthesizers, and I set about making the first combat draft, aiming for something that sort of sounded like the Space Jam soundtrack, Specifically that one song that goes, you're ready for this, do 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 um, This is being recorded, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, legally dissimilar once again. Are you ready? I would like to clarify now, that is a bad song. Like, showing you that probably actively hurt my career as a music composer. But it's bad for a number of reasons, which I'll talk about. It's basically monophonic, which would work as like a 90s loop-based loop dance music where you have a vocals over the top to draw the attention. But as gameplay music, it became repetitive incredibly quickly. It's also way too attention-grabbing, which also helped it be repetitive and the aesthetic was sort of more like it had an attitude to it whereas I was trying to aim for more of just like colorful and cartoony so scrapped that one went back to the drawing board 
looked at a bunch of 90s action comedies and found that a lot of them weren't big orchestral scores, they were just like a guy in a room with a keyboard. Um, so I did one of those. I found the Seinfeld slap bass on the Korg M1 and I used it heavily. So I thought that was an improvement. It was fully authentic, like every sound came from a 90s era synthesizer. It matched the visuals a bit better because it had that sort of like goofy, cartoony sort of feel to it. Uh, there was a little bit of a lo-fi aesthetic to it because of the 90s era synths, which I didn't think was a bad thing, but I showed it to Winston and he did not like it. He said that there was no tension and that it was too like light-hearted and goofy. And at the time, me not taking criticism well, I was like, bro, it's a robot vacuum cleaner game, what are you talking about? But we had a big conversation about what we wanted the music to achieve, and eventually we came up with this. <laughs> So, Keynet among you may notice, not particularly 90s sounding. And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering why did you spend 20 minutes talking about 90s synthesizers only to show the orchestral song that you made. And that's fair, that's valid. Um, but we did still do a little bit of the 90s stuff in other game modes and during cinematics, but we just found that playing it serious with the orchestral music worked a lot better um, but we did still try to avoid all of the like Hans Zimmer bwams and like synth drones and hybrid synth stuff from like modern orchestral music, soundtrack music, I should say. Um, but it did work better for these reasons. We found that the a lot of the comedy in Justice Sucks comes from juxtaposing cuteness and violence. It's about having this little cute little robot vacuum cleaner guy like brutally devouring that little thief and then drinking all their blood. Like, that was the main joke. And having the, like, goofy 90s music undercut that joke a little bit, whereas the melodramatic serious music, sort of like, playing it super serious while you're just sort of scooting around as a little robot vacuum cleaner, was funny. It was just funny. So, also, towards the ends of some game modes, there's a phase where you have to clean up all the bodies and the visuals go a lot brighter and more colorful and like a really cheerful cleaning song kicks in. Um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, this meme's still relevant, by the way. <laughs> Um, here's another example to sort of articulate what I'm talking about. Towards the end of the game, after you defeat the big bad, there's your yellow robot friend guy. I don't know what he is. I've lost track. Um, <laughs> he's mortally wounded, and like I decided to go as over-the-top melodramatic as I could with the music. Um,
So that song was uh, legally dissimilar to Semi-Charmed Life by Third Eye Blind. Hey, you got it. <laughs> um, that's another example of that like emotional whiplash I was talking about, just like hard left turn in like the emotion. Very useful. Uh, another reason the orchestral stuff worked heaps better was the 90s stuff became repetitive incredibly quickly. And a big problem we have to deal with as video game music composers is longevity. Like, how do you make a song not get annoying after listening to it on loop for 20 minutes? Uh, often you'll find that the more diverse a song is, the more little hooks and melodies and changes and stuff, the more aware of it you are, and the more aware of the song you are, the more aware of the loop you are, so the song tends to become stale more quickly. For gameplay sections that are gonna loop heaps, or they're more like dialogue driven or SFX driven, sometimes it's better to have your music be a little bit more backgrounded and textural, but if you make it too backgrounded, it's not gonna be as effective in the first place, so it's sort of like a line that you have to tread. I made a cool graph about it. Uh, so vocal songs are the biz biggest example of this. Uh, vocals are in inherently attention grabbing. Like the human ear is so in tune to hear human voice that when it's in background music, it like instinctively brings it to the focus. Um, you'll find that a lot of songs that do have uh, vocals in their background music, I'm sure everyone's played Persona 5 or whatever, most of them tend to have like a chorus and then an extended instrumental section and then they'll bring vocals back in, so sort of fading in and out of focus. Um, but generally, vocal songs should best be saved for sections with no dialogue or really simple gameplay that doesn't require a whole lot of concentration. We had a couple of vocal songs in Justice Sucks. Most of them were used for cinematics with one exception, which was the cleaning frenzy mode, which I'll, I'll play a clip of it now, but pay attention to how limited the gameplay is. So, wasn't a whole lot going on in the gameplay that required concentration. Um, this is a personal opinion. I felt that game mode was kind of boring. I, I'm sure there's some freaks out there who that was their favorite game mode in the game, but for me, it kind of required something to be the focus of it and to spice it up a little bit. Um, so, I made a vocal song. Um, and I will say, if there is an opportunity to use vocal songs in your game, it's generally worth it because they work really well as a marketing tool. So that song we used in the second trailer, the opening theme, which I'll talk about in a second, was used as the main trailer and they received a lot of positive press because of that. Um, just be aware of the context you're gonna use the song in. Um, yeah, I'll talk about implementation a little bit now. This is boring, but I'm gonna talk about it. Um, I wanted to use FMOD for this project so I could do some dynamic layering and some beat match transitions and, and stuff like that. But in the end, we decided against it to keep resource costs down. And FMOD is a really good program and I strongly recommend using it, but there is a little bit of overhead involved and we didn't entirely feel it was necessary in this. Um, so we used our own music system and it was basically, you had a music class and each object would have a lead a looping body and then a tail that played when the song stopped. Um, and with that, we sort of coded this general layout. So like level starts, it plays a little level start sting, stealth lead plays, then the stealth loop, and then once combat starts, it does the combat lead, combat loop, 
and then when combat ends, it plays a tail and fades back into the sneaky music. Um, there was also an enemy awareness riser, which was just like an ominous tone that sort of faded up as enemies began to notice you. Um, but that was pretty much it. And that's like, I would say that's probably minimum viable product when it comes to a stealth action game, but it does do the job pretty effectively. Um, there was a couple of like Easter eggs and stuff where different music would play in different rooms and like the music would switch when you do certain stuff, but like that was pretty much the bones of the entire thing. Um, a big problem I made, and this is something to be aware of, is I made a lot of combat loops that went for about five and a half minutes. And if you're in combat in this game for five minutes without killing everyone or dying, you are playing the game wrong. There's like songs that I don't think anybody heard towards like the end of them. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a thing I did. Um, the opening credit song, so some of you might be familiar with Monster Mansion, Jacob Leaney, he's done a couple of talks here before, he's a lovely guy. Um, we worked on this song together, which was, we started with a recreation of Baby One More Time by Britney Spears, and we took those instruments and structure and rewrote it, and we came up with this. <laughs> Up inside a world I don't recognize Playing it cool but I can't get you off my mind Just suck it up, I gotta do what I can To get back to you, back to all that we had Ain't nobody holding me back, you know I'm coming for you So I took, this is the part where I talk about motifs, I took two main motifs from that. There was the bad guy motif, which was from the start, which I made an intro and Jacob gave me a bunch of flack because he said it sounded too much like Everybody by the Backstreet Boys. Um, I did an analysis here to show that it's completely different and original. Um, I found this to be an incredibly useful motif. Like it's a good length and simplicity that I could use it as a baseline or a melody, and it had a recognizable rhythm, so when I did just slot it into random spots, it became very recognizable. I used mostly the yellow section and the blue section in a couple of bits, but basically, when the bad guys did anything, it was like, bam, motif. Um, the most egregious example I have is the second phase of the boss fight Winston asked me to make something that sounded like Metal Gear Rising, um, and I made this. For our, I should remind you, it is a game about a robot vacuum cleaner. second half, I kind of went a bit off the wall. I made it a little bit dubstepy. I don't, I don't know why I did, but it sounded cool. Yeah, so that was just the whole motif as the baseline through that entire last section, and I really enjoyed that song. Um, here was when the main villain gets introduced, I just like slotted in to sort of build that motif up a little bit. Um, the good guy motif, which I took from the chorus, I was sort of hoping that people would get the lyrics from the song in their head and that would help sell the emotional intent of the motif. It's kind of not, it was a difficult motif to use because it doesn't really have a rhythm and it's mostly just like 
a G major scale going down, um, which sort of didn't really make it stand out heaps. I used it in the uh, tutorial era area, which was like a Randy Newman Toy Story type song, but I had to switch the rhythm up a little bit. Uh. <laughs> So in the big climactic showdown, you've got to use the hero motif. So I modulated the second bar up an octave, and it'll come up on the screen when it happens. Spoilers for Justice Sucks, by the way. This is the I'm showing the entire game out of order. But um, so, motivic writing is really cool um, if used right. Uh, it also was a really helpful tool to me in sort of breaking through writer's block, like because I could like try out these melodies in different scenarios and then sort of build on them in interesting ways. I will say, if you are planning on doing some motifs, try to make them as simple as they can be while still being recognizable and a big tool to do that is rhythm, which is often overlooked a little bit, but trying to keep it to like no more than two or three different rhythmic elements um, and don't just have quavers like I did before. Uh, how long are we looking? 20 minutes. Uh, I'll briefly talk about menu sounds. I've fallen into the habit of making all of my menus just drum machines because I think it's really fun. Um, and it also saves a bunch of work because instead of actually making UI sounds, I can just use drum samples. So I've made a little clip. So the first time we got playtesters in, I think the guy who was playing it just played around in the menu doing nothing for like 10 minutes, and that was so rewarding. Um, I didn't format this slide. This is a lot of information. But basically, I separated the menu into moving forward, which is like moving from the main menu to level select, or moving backwards, which is like the other direction. And so I had kicks for moving forward, snares for moving backwards, toms for changing tabs, there's like the turntable when you change levels, um, orchestra hits for gold buttons, and then the ability change screen, I used an even more vintage drum machine, but it was mostly just like 808s and 909s. There's a lot of sounds, like each of those objects probably has about three or four sounds attached to it, but it was quite quick to smash out because I was mostly just using samples that were already made. Um, oh, we got 18 minutes. Hmm. All right, wind sequence, uh, I just wanted to show this because I thought I did a good job. So the main thing there, the little score items that spawn, like the little words that come up and then go into the score, um, I wanted something that sounded like game showy. So I did like a tremolo on a dulcitone chord, dulcitone playing major chords, and they sort of move up the whole tone scale. So like the technique of planing 
which is a cool thing that you see a bunch in like Nintendo soundtracks where it's you take the same chord shape and you just like move it up a scale. With the whole tone scale, if you play it on single notes, it sounds like dreaming. But if you play it with major chords, it sounds like the pokies, which is really cool. <laughs> It goes pretty high. I don't think anyone can actually get a score that is that high. Um, the other thing that I really liked was the, so you heard the little, like it was a drum fill and then like a turntable scratch and a vocal hit for the unlock sounds. I made a bunch of these. I think I made like 13 or 14. Um, and I think they're my favorite sound in the game. Here's my favorites. <laughs> Um, this is a boring slide, but it is important. Uh, I think a lot of like indie game music people specifically ignore mastering a lot. Uh, recently, Sony did introduce a standard, which I think is a good standard to follow. Um, so basically, you've got to play your game for half an hour as normal, record the audio, and then run it through a metering plugin to measure the LUFS, which is uh, loud units full scale which is just a way of measuring the perceived loudness of something over time, sort of like an average loudness. And so you want to target minus 23, minus, uh, minus 23 with a true beak of minus two, um, which if you're not hitting that, there are some good maximizers. Like I know Isotopes Maximizer, you can input the target LUFS and click an analyze button and it'll analyze your song and then adjust the threshold so you're meeting that. That range is for music, sound effects, and dialogue, and everything. It's probably, I would say, too high of a dynamic range for just music. Like, your peaks, if they're still hitting minus two, are going to cut through the mix probably too much. Um, I often, because I'm lazy, just master my song to minus 14, which is the Spotify standard, or the point at which Spotify does its own loudness stuff under the hood. Um, and then bring the entire mix down, which will leave more headphones for sound effects. I probably would say that minus 14 is also too crushed as well. Um, I don't know. I found a paper that measured a bunch of like the average loudness. I can find a link for it if anyone's interested, but basically dialogue should always be the loudest. Weapon and attack sound effects should probably be next, and then music for combat was actually quite quiet, like a lot quieter than you expect. Just as sucks, I went way too loud with the music. Um, so something to be aware of, you kind of want your SFX that acts as auditory cues to be the main focus behind dialogue. So just always be aware of leaving room for that in your mix. Um, dang, that's a boring slide. All right, that's the end. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
Mitch did a really good job of finding places in the menus and in the game over sequences and the, the game modes that are like a bit more dry. Uh, the game mode, the cleaning mode that has that good song, we would have cut that mode, I think, if Mitch hadn't made that song. So uh, I just want to congratulate him on the work he's done. <laughs> Thank you. That's really interesting. Sorry. Yes, let's <laughs> um, That's really interesting to hear. So you've been working in-house at Samurai Punk for some time. I think you um, went full-time for this project, or were you full-time just before that? Uh, started in 2020. Yeah, but we, Mitch has been our composer and sound designer since Fella. We haven't yeah. worked with anyone else. Yeah. Um, oh, I have two questions now. First, I'd love to know how that working relationship began and what kind of drew you... I suppose you hired him, so what drew you to his sound? Uh, we were at parties together because he's <laughs> friends with my... We are friends with the same friends. Uh, from Swinburne, I think. Yeah. But you, weren't, you didn't go to Swinburne. I think I, what, what it was, I was in a shitty punk band at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, with, and with Josh, yeah. Nick came to one of our gigs, and I was talking about how I wanted to get into video game music. And it, I said video game sound, actually. And he put me onto Feather just doing sound effects. And the soundtrack he had at the time... I just was, stole some post-rock, I think. It was like a prog rock song yeah. for our game where a bird flies around. Yeah, as so people know Feather, it has this beautiful like orchestral score now. Uh, so Mitch started making sounds for that, yeah. music for that. So like, if you're working on something and you know for a fact that you can do a better job than something that's already there, it's sometimes worth just putting in the effort in your own time and if it's inarguably better and you show it to the designer, then like you've just found some work for yourself, really. Yeah, because after that we just, basically with Feather, every time we were making a new zone or any time I needed more space to fill, because Feather is like 50% music, um, we would just sort of collaborate on like the, uh, how the music could integrate, or Mitch would make a song and then we would integrate that into the world and vice versa. And then from there it just made sense to work together on future games, because I think you didn't do all of the sound on Feather, there was some legacy stuff, yeah. and, but then Justice Suck, or Rumbo, and Screen Sheet Unplugged, Rip Screenshot Unplugged sound design. For some reason, we never redid this, the Good. sound from just for Screenshot Unplugged. Um, I would have loved to. And uh, yeah, and, and then by Justice Sucks, there was so much music integrated into it. You had just finished doing trios, I think, and it just made sense to make it full time and bring you on from the start of the project rather than having it be like an afterthought. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you sort of mentioned just before something that I think is so interesting, the idea that this cleaning mode stayed in because the music worked in it mm. so well. Um, that's really exciting to hear that, like, you know, there's this kind of, like, deep collaboration happening. And I'm wondering if there are kind of other examples or other ways that the music and sound design process has influenced game design. Because um, we hear a lot from the other side of things, of course. Uh I worked with uh, it was Syrian and Callum, who were the art team on this project. Mm. I sort of stuck pretty closely with them, and Jordi as well. Um, <coughs> and yeah, UI design. And they would often have a bunch of like goofy ideas of like, hey, you should do this wacky thing, or like, there's like the hacking sound in the game mm. is made up of the the internet modem from like the '90s modem sound. And I just like cut that up with him. Like that was Geordie's idea. Like ideas come from everyone on the team, especially like music and sound, especially. It's like everyone has good ideas in their head and it's like you should always gather them up, you know? Totally. Um, I think that leads on to a question here that I think is really interesting, sort of about your research process. Uh, when you're referencing a style or era of music, uh, what does it take to sort of boil it down to its essence? How long does that process take? Um, it, I guess it depends on the genre itself. Like electronic music, it's mm. quite easy to look at the plugins they're making and sort of like, I do a lot of work with synths, so I am quite good at sort of like making my own presets that sound very similar to something else that's been used. It's like, it is a good exercise to do trying to recreate a song as identical as you can. Mm. And like we did it for the opening credit song and then just like move the melodies and change the chords and everything. And it like is its own thing now. It's like, yeah, it's it definitely something you should practice, I think. 
Pierre. Uh, completely unsurprisingly to me, we have a question that returns us to your boring slide. Um, did you use any 90s mixing and mastering techniques to add more authenticity? I tried that. I did some like tonal analysis and some like EQ rebalance according to some like 90s inspiration tracks I had. Um, but towards the end of the game, when the visuals were coming into like a more finished state, the 90s stuff sort of took more of a backseat to like the colorful cartoony stuff. And I found that like when I did try it out with more like lo-fi 90s aesthetic stuff, it like it sort of clashed a bit, you know? Like it didn't really match the visuals. Um, so yeah, I tried to just do have it be more in line with like modern games for the mastering and mixing stage. I was gonna ask, um, you know, working with sort of like since developed like during that period, but making but making music for a contemporary game, like how you found that balance. Do you think the mastering was kind of key to that? Um, I think I, I always approach mastering from more of like a technical standpoint than like an artistic standpoint. Mm. Like there is a lot of artistry involved in it, but like I'm pretty much only doing it because we don't have, like we're not gonna pay a mastering guy <laughs> to do it basically. Um, but yeah, it's something to be aware of and you do get better at it as it goes on. Like I think the two projects I've done after Justice Sucks, the mastering is a lot better and I have a lot more tools to use. Mm -hmm. I should also bring up now, I used emulations for all of the 90 synths because I don't have $100,000. <laughs> like, uh, Roland Cloud is pretty good. I will say the Arturia stuff is a lot better if you can afford that. Um, and the Korg M1, Korg has their own emulation of that software that's pretty identical to the original. Um, so those are the main ones I used. And yeah. Was this, um was, you know, this kind of 90s sensibility, was that a new area for you um, oh, yeah. to, like, compose in? <laughs> like I, I liked some 90s stuff. The 90s stuff they wanted me to emulate was not stuff that they. I liked. <laughs> yeah, so. You have a desk in our office, Mitch. I know. Um, yeah, so I did sort of have to, like, dive in head first. I spent, like weeks listening to Aqua and Spice Girls and stuff, and it consumed my entire life. <laughs> they have some good songs, actually, turns out. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was a difficult to sort of put my brain into that sort of mindset. And also, I sort of stayed in that sort of mindset for, like, months after finishing the project. And it took me a while to make, like, real music <laughs> again. <laughs> Um, have you worked on a project like this where you were kind of given a particular like aesthetic or style to work? I mean, style or era to work towards that you had to that you had to compose for? Uh, yeah, I think it is always good to when you're working with a director who has an example of something that they know works already, mm -hmm. and you can sort of build off that and put your own style to it. Um, I think. Just as sucks, because it was my first big project, a lot of the stuff Winston gave me was very like rigid. He's like, I want it to sound exactly like this song, um, which is a, like, a skill set that I sort of developed a bit working on this project. But like, yeah, making something sound exactly like something else is a useful tool to have, because you are going to have a lot of directors who like, get that in their head as like, the ideal for the game mode, you know? Whereas I guess like Feather would have been, we were just like, we just need something that suits the aesthetic. Yeah. And then we just found a sound that fit that aesthetic. Yeah. And then once that was defined, we just continue to make stuff in that, that realm, right? Yeah. Like you'll, you'll have projects that you have free reign and that's very exciting, but I think you'll find most of the time there's a kind of rigid structure that you need to fit into. Do you find it easier to work with a tight brief or a kind of sense of the vibe or the gap that needs to be filled? Ooh, I guess it depends on the genre of music I'm making. Um, I think something that Nick and Winston like about my skill set is they can give me like 
whatever, like a city pop song or like any weird genre they find and after like a couple of weeks I will be able to recreate it moderately accurately. Um, and sometimes that's a lot easier because it gives you the palette already. You don't have to make your own palette and like you can just work within that structure a bit. I like it. Uh, I have one final question that I want to ask both of you, I think. Um, from the audience, if you could choose a different era or distinct style of music for this game or for your next game, whatever that will be, what would you choose? Ooh. Let's actually go, we could go ideal. We could go, do you want to go I ideal? Want early 2000s back. <laughs> I want to bring back crunk music. I want to bring back ska music. Ni like early 2000s emo, like that would be absolutely ideal for me. Um, Nick? Well, I mean, I'd like to see more hip hop, like mm -hmm. hardcore rap in games, but I don't think we're like the right, potentially the right people to do that. Um, <laughs> um, Why? <Potentially. laughs> no, I don't know. Um, personally, uh, I would also love to see some sludge in games and some like, yeah, some really like heavy doom. Uh, I just don't know what the right fit for that is, but I do have a project or two in mind. <laughs> the sludge game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just uh, never gonna get shipped. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Could everyone please give Mitchell a big hand and Nick a small hand? <laughs>